my practice uh, started in India, where I'm from. And for a long time, it irritated me that whatever we did was called low tech. I don't know why, because the materials were brownish looking. Everything came into low tech. And the similar things, same, same structures in other parts were called high tech. So that's the thing I want to discuss with all of you later. It bothered me because, like you said, you know, you mentioned the region from where I come, but I, my hope really is that we, uh, at least in an engineering conference, we should be able to assume that there are on there's only one gravity all over the world. And so the, that all our structures are universal. With that, I want to begin. And I want to say that, you know, I have this chosen this topic because um, from a very early um, formative years of mine, uh, and when I started my practice state straight after graduation, that was 33 years ago, I, um, we already had graduated into a landscape where we, we were well aware of the environmental impact that contemporary building habits were creating. So uh, I think it's, we can agree on the fact that we need to rethink materiality, but instead of uh, being lured into different uh, you know, material discussions and the rhetoric between mud versus concrete and things like that, um, I felt that structural design would actually enable uh, more conscious use. So I, I felt that the importance was to build knowledge while building buildings. And I started with structural, um, you know, seeing where structural design can optimize um, buildings. And I always wondered, and I just want to give you the part that probably I bring from my uh, Indian context, that we are an old civilization and I've seen that we had produced all kinds of incredible architecture with any material that was lying around. Actually, everywhere in the world we've done it. If there's ice, you build with ice. If there's, there are no trees, then you have to build shells with earth and so on. And the emphasis was on the human potential and not on merely putting the architectural effort on on new materials and so on, which come at a high environmental price. So I used to always wonder how we went from here, uh, you know, building with whatever is lying around and shifting the emphasis on how, how to cultivate the human eye, the human skill, the hands, the brain and whatnot to be able to achieve bigger and bigger spans and taller and taller buildings. And from that kind of landscape where you know, where all the socio-economic and other considerations um, sort of make you wonder what happened in the post-industrial period, um, where, I mean, I graduated in Bombay in this kind of city where modern buildings um, in the background, the standard over-standardized code-based regulated, uh, over-regulated solution for housing, and on the front, you have a uh, informal, what is called informal, everything that wasn't controlled um, is informal. And you don't know actually which one is worse because <laughs> both, both look quite op oppressive. Uh, one costs a lot of money, um, but both are ugly in their own ways. And one of them is rapidly increasing and spreading. So through these, aspects, I began to think a lot about materiality and to, uh, to notice how even a mere material, like I, I mean a very um, timeless material, like brick, the first manufactured material, has been reduced to mere infilling, uh, you know. All over the world, in Australia, they call it brick veneer. Uh, everywhere, the brick is not even being allowed to carry load in today's time. So that bothered me. And uh, through these type of concerns, I started trying to understand that uh, how structural design could pave the way for new materiality and new forms. First of all, checking over design, reducing expenditure of materials with high embodied energy, enabling real innovations towards sustainability, but also critically looking at 
regulations being able to contribute to to more uh, more useful codes and also the problem of our times to be able to absorb urban waste permanently into architecture. These are some of the themes that I'm going to show through the rest of the um, presentation. No more words, just images. Um, I'm going to start with uh, re realizing how I started trying to understand the efficiency of brick making before industrial uh, times where the kiln itself was the structure, the stacking system was the kiln. So, the, the, so you know, trying to begin with how it, that, that it's not just the material, but the process in which, with which the material is sourced or made, etc., where already a lot of wastage can be seen. Typical kilns absorb about 40% of the energy of the firing in each firing. So, you know, these kind of um, awarenesses led to also some of my own discoveries that a brick is not just a brick. How we used to make it and how we are now making it makes all the difference. And yet in our green rating systems, we have standard figures as if all this d doesn't matter. So there, is the, there, is the, there are the, uh, the developed countries who've got fixed figures for, for uh, how many kilojoules something con consumes. And then there's the rest of the world uh, where, where we go on business as usual, very efficient because that's what we can afford. So these were the type of thoughts through which I began my first uh, buildings. And uh, I tried here to span about four meters with um, terracotta because I discovered that the potters were not able to sell their products. And I realized that instead of urbanization threatening their livelihood, it would be great if, if uh, we could guarantee uh, absorption of their pr products. So I, I, of course, relied on the catenary curve to be able to uh, do away with the substructure that went, uh, that was behind all the terracotta tiles that we saw in the region. So trying to do, you know, um, yesterday when John spoke, I was uh, really, you know, uh, what we missed all our life, you know, is to find engineers like that. We, we instead, because we were young, we were always told by all the en engineers that whatever we did were not possible. <laughs> whatever we would design, they would tell us this is not possible. And uh, I, I was, uh, I had to rely on my craftsmen and on empirical studies, because I knew that gravity is such a sacred thing that it is not fickle, it's not gonna change its mind, and once it stands, it's gonna stand. It's not gonna not stand after five minutes. So I'll know then and there if it stood. So some kind of naive attitude on my part, and um, you know, saving myself from the doubters. You know, nowadays, uh, I can, uh, after all these years, I can, uh, if, if somebody tells me that this is not possible, instead of changing the design, I would change the engineer. Sorry, engineers. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think, um, so with this kind of attitude, uh, I began to start using ancient methods of brick making, bricks that were not as strong as the factory bricks, but, but now I know that these are the good bricks because um, they are made with whichever clay is lying around, fired to whichever uh, strength that that earth can go. And so I realized that in these small details is the innovation. So when I show those things, you can't even see what was designed. And even, for example, the lime mortar that required some additional 5 or 10% of cement to be able to compete with the speed of construction because of the initial setting strength being slow. So there were this very minute, um, you know, d design uh, interventions that led to this kind of work. But each project undertaken allowed me to feel more empowered to go on with other ideas. So the struggle became less and less. But of course, we learn more and more what we don't know. 
So then, you know, we are permanently in, in those kind of new questions. But I also learned through the brick makers that it's possible to create in an industry of terracotta products that are also manufactured just like they used to be done in the field, fired with coconut shells on the field, etc. Because these people are also rice farmers and so on. They are not used to eight hours of work, you know, like the industrial culture, which actually burdens all the products with huge overheads. So I tried to dodge all of that and create contemporary architecture with the materials lying around, with whoever is around and who needs employment and so on, and uh, yet redefining how spaces can look and always trying to achieve the same amount of square meters with uh, far less materials or rather using those materials to achieve way more uh, built space. That was uh, the way I wanted to measure progress. So um, this, is the, this is the first project, Wall House, which um, became a lab for me. And in this project, there were many, many things that um, went beyond. I mean, even, in the, even the, the foundation is made out of rammed earth by adding 5% of cement, but using the pit to be like a formwork and filling that layers, uh, filling that back. So um, somehow, the use of those kind of pre-industrial way of making bricks went on to be applied you know, in floors where you don't need insulation to use very flat arches. And uh, then we started extruding these uh, on the site, you know, not so that non-potters could also contribute slightly trapezoidal um, hollow blocks that were used for kind of jack arches with prefab steel beams. I mean, uh, I mean, concrete beams with just one reinforcement bar. A very, uh, you know, um, easy to. We had to always compete with the speed of construction, but we were trying to reduce the embodied energy content in the materials that we used. So then I started developing a lot of um, a range of structural systems. Um, the vault could be used, um, uh, was the most efficient, but you couldn't use the roof. So when you needed to use the roof, and it was going to have to um, create the envelope of thermal insulation, then I had this kind of system. Um, for those rooms. And then, meanwhile, I found a way to use also, because, you know, each, what I was talking about, building knowledge and building community uh, while building buildings, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that uh, leads to a lot of, um, you know, uh, progressive growth, actually, because because I was hanging around with those people or the, the, the people who, artisans of, with, who work with this material, I was finally able to come up with an idea to use the actual she uh, shells, I was going to say, <laughs> pots that they try to sell. You know, these are traditional cooking pots. Nobody's going to use them, but they still make them because it's a tradition and once in a year, they, they actually cook rice in it on, on a festival. So I, I came back to the original idea um, of what made me be concerned about artisan communities. And then I got the idea to use these kind of um, 70 centimeter bowls as lost form work to be able to reduce the, to create like a waffle slab and reduce the steel content almost by 60%. So I started using, because see, we are working in areas where resources, there's a resource crunch, and form work, along with forms, I was researching form work, because form work is a very expensive thing. And I was trying to make form work more affordable. So in this case, we were able to use all the rubbish planks that you have lying around and use a put those pots as to f form the filler slab and use the gaps to, be, to fill it up to the lip with clay. And then you could pour your concrete and 
just hose uh, wash the clay off, and then you got this kind of ceiling. Of course, in this house, it was my lab, lab so there's a, you would wonder why it's sitting on steel beams, but that's for another experiment that we were doing. But this uh, just four meter span was a test for a large 14 meter hall that I was uh, working towards, because I knew with the growing span, there would be steel savings. So then, uh, you know, in this house, you see all those applications of terracotta. And um, I will come to the ferro cement slabs in just a bit. But basically, here you see all kinds of six or seven different systems. And I, it turned out, though the architecture looks quite luxurious, you know, in the previous, um, just a minute. Oh, yeah, this is going backward. OK, OK, I'm going. Oh, I wanted to go back, but ah, yeah, I think this is going back here. Yeah. Sorry. So while this test um, looked very luxurious, I want you to know they were really cost competitive. It is um, the kind of beauty that you get when you use just the minimum. And therefore, it, you don't realize how economic these solutions have been. But um, the fact is that for the further low cost housing, these kind of techniques became so cost competitive that we did a lot of very low budget. I think I can't go any cheaper than that. That's the kind of um, studies um, for the applications we did. But also these systems started being applied for bus sheds and so on. And that's when you know that it's really economic, that it is user friendly, and that people in the place uh, find it um, you know, worth, uh, worth the trouble, let's say, because of the savings. So around this time, um, you know, the, we had uh, from the Oroville Earth Institute, the, there was the, the technique of rammed earth construction with 5% cement stabilization that uh, a lot of us um, tried to use uh, and apply, you know, in the, in the area. But for me, uh, I mean, also the idea to use the rammed earth foundations for those structures came through this knowledge that came from Satprem, who uh, was advocating that. I had a bit of problem with mixing cement with earth. I still have this problem. But I have still, you know, um, explored this type of hybrid materials. In, in this case, I started, um, in any case, a, spending this, the earth that we have to dig out for wastewater treatment plants and so on, I started employing, maybe not the entire project is made with cement stabilized rammed earth, but the earth that is dug out is spent into the walls. So we started approaching the structures um, in a very kind of a hybrid way, um, using various geometries, various technologies and, you know, um, just doing the householding of resources, um, uh, how much to spend on what you buy, how much to uh, employ people, and so on. So in this case, um, in this co-housing project, which was one of the bigger applications of these techniques, you see that the roofing system has been very successfully applied. And it, uh, we arrived at a really, uh, I mean, a very affordable structure per, for permanent housing. So these, some of this, this is to show that some of the ideas tested in the wall house were actually meant to be applied uh, onto the other projects because that wall house was my own house. So I didn't have to look for guinea pigs to experiment. I could uh, do the tests. Uh, we, we were doing all these buildings without any research budget. So it had to be tested somewhere. But this is one of the housing uh, projects. So now I'm going to come to um, the most radical experimentation that I did, which was uh, involving baking of mud structures in situ. So there's Ray Meeker, who's a uh, Californian ceramist who has pioneered this technology. I landed up writing my PhD on this. Um, and um, uh, you know, because I had got to observe him at work, building, uh, trying to save the 40% of energy that would normally go into the brick kilns when you fire products in a kiln. So he, he had taken it upon himself to do several, around 20 different structures, one after the other, over 
many, many years. And I, inside those structures that he, he tried to build mud houses and fire them, he needed products to stuff inside. And so a lot of the products that I've shown you were stuffed inside his kilns, actually in his test structures. And um, I have done two or three, no, three, uh, three projects with this technique, but this one I'm going to show you for, uh, th 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 that is about homes for homeless children in Pondicherry. This is the one I eventually did after I wrote my PhD on it and I had discovered the open questions. Basically what it does is that it, uh, what you need to do is you need to build a structure that uh, uh, you would, do domes, vaults, whatever you can do with earth construction. And normally these uh, structures would first have to withstand as, as pure mud structures. Then they have to withstand firing when everything is going to be wobbly, when the vitrification process is going on. And then afterwards it's going to stand as a ceramic structure, which is a permanent structure. So the reason, as I told you, uh, that if if this space is treated as a kiln, then uh, typically it's very complicated, so I'm thinking how to explain it quickly. But normally in, uh, in kind of brick making, as I said, the kiln, the, the, there's a brick kiln and the products are being fired inside in modern kilns like the Hoffman kiln and so on, in the industrial practice, not the field practice. So, this heat is wasted, half of it is wasted into the wall, each firing. That's the heat ray maker is trying to tap and use to fire the uh, architecture, which is going to first behave as a kiln as a result. So that is the whole aim. So what he has to do is build a mud structure, fill it with products, fire it, and the heat that would have otherwise been absorbed by the wall with some very innovative insulation, etc., will be tapped and the uh, structure is then ceramic. The big advantage for me, and that's why I called it uh, building with fire, was that fire is the cement. I feel that if you don't take the fire, to, if you don't take the products to the fire in the industrial situation, instead you bring the fire to the home, then if you manage to use it, properly, then you do away with cement and you can fi make whatever sizes, shapes, whatever you want. And uh, you can treat the house as a producer of building materials rather than a consumer. Architecture is suddenly not the consumer, but a pro producer of local building materials. So you see, it's a very complicated thing, no time to explain. There are flue holes uh, to bring oxygen, there are fire boxes down there, and it's very complicated because it has to first function as a kiln and an efficient kiln. So then it gets baked for three or four days, depending on the size of the project, and the products get vitrified, the shell will show some cracks, it'll expand, but it's going to contract again when it cools, and so the cracks don't matter, and then there's going to be a waterproofing layer. Of course, many more complex structures have been built uh, by Ray over his uh, 20 structures, but in this case, the reason it, the shape looks so simple is what I did in this project, in the series of on top of his experimentations, is to look at the whole thing as a catenary dome, because I realized that he, it is the, the main challenge for him was to fire the walls through. So if you, there are no walls, then you don't have those thrust, you don't have to have a um, lot of mass, but the catenary dome becomes almost vertical towards the end, so it, it's okay to use it as an architectural thing. So like a sh real eggshell, it actually performs really well, and then we were able to fire it through. So. Then the people like this, um, uh, these bricks that are fired inside here can be actually sold or used to finish the other parts of the architecture. So this was a very experimental project and, um, and of course I continue to uh, dwell on some of these open questions but I hope somebody else will take them up. Uh, Ray Mika has stopped but he, he found the opportunity that in such structures, from wash basins to toilet pans, tiles, there's so many things you could produce inside this. And I'm seeing that whole thing as one 
uh, one a process of building material production because about 70% of the things you produce are products. And we could uh, produce other ceramic products here inside this kind of shells. And then, of course, it's, it's completed. It's a project without any budget. So it's com completed using broken tiles and so on. But I want to just um, now just shift a little bit to the natural materials uh, that I, while I did those experiments, I was living in this hut myself. And I, while living in this, I also discovered, uh, in continuation of the bamboo discussion here, I discovered that round wood has so much potential still to be optimized, because round wood, uh, you know, you, I can use three-year-old members, and in order to cut it rectangular, I'll have to wait 25 years. So straight away, you can see the, what, uh, you know, a, lo a lot of houses are not, uh, are not built for mass production, and there's no need to grow every, build everything out of timber and rectangular sections. So there's a, there's a lot of other experimentation I have done on the side while living in such kind of a house where I was able to question how permanent should architecture be, how these kind of dry constructions allow you to renew certain members and not the whole architecture, and you know, going into what dry construction allows and so on, and also rope and things, where, when does wood and its flexibility, like in fibers, there's such a graded transition. I'm just building up for my ferrocement discussion with meshes, but in this you see there are so many meshes and woven um, members, you know, as well. But uh, yeah, so I used to live under this roof and contemplate. I thought it would last for a year or two, but I landed up living here for at least 10 years before I built that other house. So, um, and even here, the, the, there are no walls. And I, I, I realized that if the roofs can come down to the floor, then you save a lot of unnecessary materials and, um, and also have simpler forms. The, even the way the thatch was attached, you know, in, compared to the previous vernacular way of doing it, um, some of these roofs, uh, some of this kind of architecture became a bit more permanent looking. Um, and in this, we have done away with a lot of in-between members by supporting thatch on GI wires and a grid made on that. Uh, so, you know, there are all these you know, householding of all kinds of materials. And with this, the same kind of um, experience empowered me to look at any material that, you know, whatever is available locally to be able to see what can be used directly from nature and how it can be engineered to be able to really um, sort of um, optimize their application, you know, and allow the handmade skills and et, et cetera to, to, to all the money that is saved from material purchase can go into developing skills and therefore knowledge and also consciousness and ingenuity. So, um, yeah, so there are many other applications with, where, you know, um, materials literally from the ground under you have been applied. But Talking about more kind of uh, manufactured materials, I have been looking at um, the potential of ferrocement because I think in the, you know, we tend to use concrete because of it's easy to calculate, it's uh, ready-made, etc. But I think materials, if we were to optimize concrete, uh, reinforce concrete, and go towards more use of mesh and thinner sections entering ferrocement. Again, there is a big problem in how to calculate those kind of surface structures, and that's why they are not done. And I think um, there is a huge potential here, which I have been, uh, again, this is a material I've been exploring since 25 years, building upon the work of architects like Nervi. So, um, I have had the chance to collaborate also with Mike Schleich since um, we had the chance to exhibit our work in the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2016. And we have been exploring natural meshes um, 
of course, glass fiber and other things, other fibers that he is into, carbon fiber actually, but also to try to use modern matrix to be able, or, or more, uh, you know, more complex uh, optimized versions to allow even thinner material. But the classic cement uh, allows us to build 25 millimeter, uh, you know, profiles but we've gone up to 12 millimeter in most of our sections. One of the examples that I'm going to show, I'm running out of time, but I'm going to, since you, I'm sure you will all understand when I just show you the pictures. One application is uh, what I call fulfill homes. These houses can be stacked in a week. Um, th these are pieces that are, because of ferro cement being so thin, we have to fold and bend it to make the members rigid. So I have uh, started embedding finishing material, oxides, etc., onto the surfaces so that they are directly usable. And this is one version of uh, a housing system that can be used to build offices or whatever, uh, entire systems with beams, uh, roofing elements, and so on. Uh, in India, we can't just leave them gray. Nobody's going to like that kind of aesthetic. We have to use color to make it look more friendly, which we have done. But also the, the idea is to be able to produce these things in the backyards of um, Mason's homes with, you know, with very little space. Uh, people can just learn this kind of, make the skill. It's a very versatile material and everybody can learn how to do it. It's not very sophisticated. And so the idea is that you can produce it anywhere lift those elements and um, the site supervisor can go around, you know, but get housing, you know, trying to bring housing back to the people by cutting all those overheads of producing in factories. Here you see this was the one also uh, in collaboration with Mike Schleich. There are some little windows where you can see different meshes were used for the different elements and uh, wash basins, etc., could be directly built as part of some of these elements. There is a bathroom unit next to it, which shows how well uh, ferro cement can span. And in Mike Schleich's laboratory, we were able to do some load tests and to see that it doesn't break but bend. So there are seismic, I mean, it's very ductile. So we have yet to explore what is possible. I hope some of you will collaborate with me in the future uh, because there are so many ideas and we don't know how to um, get the structural engineering support. You can't go to somebody so famous as Mike Schleich, who's doing big bridges and ask him for three meter spans. In the case of Venice, it's, it's possible, I suppose. But I mean, so much has to be done on the household scale as well. And that's where we struggle, finding partners. So this is a sanitation unit, a shower and a toilet, and a four and a half meter span. Uh, it can be assembled in a day. I'm just going to show one more thing, um, which is trying, uh, you know, borrowing from origami. Sorry, sorry, sorry for this. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've been looking at origami crease patterns just as a starting point to be able to uh, simplify the form work that normally will be necessitated in building shells and creating facets instead of, um, of curves, but also by folding, since in origami all those pieces can be flattened, so there's no wastage of, of mesh or anything because these are only triangulated by bending. So with all these Amazon cartons, we are creating form work and be able to compress it. These are for disaster relief structures, it's a prototype, but we've also done several, four different structures in full scale to be able to see with such little mesh, even to do that, these, some of these are built without form work at all on those frames. So with very little mesh, we are able to produce, um, you know, this kind of a faceted shell. And uh, yeah, this is, I think, the cheapest structure that I have managed to come up with for that area. I'm going to skip this. But I want to show one more piece that um, I'm also using ferro cement to use, uh, uh, use uh, to build optimized beam shapes by using them as lost form work. So in this case, we've, got, we've come down from 125 cubic meters of concrete to 75 through all these leaning columns and through structural design and through 
making this kind of handmade ferro cement lost form work. And I am not going to explain these. Oh, I had a section on urban waste, but I'm just going to show some pictures and end with that. And waste materials also in the process, not only as a product. Eladio DST's forms using Tetra Pak. And now we are working on recycling denim. But I just want to add to what John said yesterday. In, as a professor, my, I would like to conclude with that. I, I believe that in today's time, with everything digitalized, it's very important to enable the thinking hand and allow the environment of experimentation because we need to experiment to evolve. I think that's the most important thing I want to say. Even if we fail, it's important to know where there is a limit of something because knowledge is not something in a book. It is what we absorbed in our minds and when we are going to be gone, it's gone with us. It's important that other people have had the opportunity to do an, you know, an embodied... Um, the knowledge has to be present inside the minds of the students and the earlier we take them on with us into the experimentation process, um, they will have many more years of empowerment and they will be able to take things further into the exciting future that we have. So I'm very happy for the environmental challenges uh, because I think through that we will have the push to develop our mind. Thank you. <laughs>